Hey, Eric here with Two Sides of Fi, just stepping in to set up our conversation with Jordan Grummet, also known as Doc G. He's a personal finance author, a physician, host of the Earn and Invest podcast. You may be familiar with that if you're a regular listener like I am. We begin our conversation as he discusses how his career as a physician changed when he discovered the fire movement. When I was a kid, my father died when I was seven and he was 40 and he was a physician. I wanted to be just like him. So yeah. my goal, my purpose, my identity were totally wrapped up in this career. I didn't think about money at all, but as the years passed and I got more and more burned out in medicine, I started looking at my life and saying, how the heck am I gonna get out of this profession that is causing me all sorts of stress? And when I started realizing that, I'm like, oh, money matters. Now, I was lucky enough mm -hmm. to be brought up by parents who modeled really great financial behavior. So I had been doing all the right things, but I had none of the vocabulary or understanding to deal yeah. with it. So imagine that you were on your merry way, making an identity out of your profession, started getting burned out, and all of a sudden someone said, poof, you're financially independent. Right. <laughs> it's not just easy to walk away from the way you've defined yourself your whole life and say, okay, I'm now financially independent. That's going to be my new identity. That's going to take up all my new time. No, of course not. I had to try to figure out what role work really plays in my life. Now I didn't need it for finances per se. How important is it? What part of my daily activities rely on this work and do I value those things? So it was really a struggle to go from having enough money to figuring out how I wanted to utilize my days. And, and ha how's that going? Because this wasn't yesterday. You've been, you know, working through this. You've had this career shift, and here you are, still uh, doing the things. Um, are you retired? Uh, you're you're still working. So here's the funny thing. I realized that I was financially and two financially independent in 2014, and I did a whole bit of nothing for the first year or so, except have panic attacks and get anxious because oh, I didn't no. know what to do with myself. <laughs> yeah. But over the years, I started really looking at my activities and I got rid of the lens of whether I was making money or not. And I just started looking at, well, what adds value to your life? And indeed, there were parts of work that were still valuable to me. When I say work, I'm talking about employment here. Yep. Um, I love doing hospice work. So I was a physician. I did general internal medicine, which meant taking care of all adults. But when I really narrowed down what I liked about my job, I got rid of about 90% of it. The 10% that still felt part of my identity and purpose was taking care of people that were dying. So I had no reason to get rid of that, and right. that does pay me. So technically, am I retired? Am I not retired? I don't even like that framework anymore. It's more like, have I subtracted out the things in my life that have caused friction and then added in things that help build a sense of purpose and identity. And so that's, I think, our real goal in life. Whether we yes. have money or we don't have money, what tools do we have available to increase purpose identity, decrease friction, and start building that life we want? And hopefully we build a financial plan aside or beside that as opposed to it being the driver of those activities. Yeah, it's, it, I want to push back on this a little bit. So you know this, this show is obviously looking at people from – both sides of Phi. I'm pre-Phi. Both you and Jason are post-Phi. You've reached your numbers and you're exploring life post-Phi. You've just released this book called Taking Stock, A Hospice Doctor's Advice on Financial Independence, Building Wealth, and Living a Regret-Free Life. It's a really emotional book. There are many moving stories about, you know, recounting personal stories from your own life and also from your experience spending the last days and weeks with patients, um, you know, as a hospice doctor. But in that book, you mention a conversation that you had with Jim Dolly, the white coat investor. We're talking about this sort of emotional aspect of life and you have the privilege of being able to focus on that. And he reminded you that money is like oxygen. Can you recount that story? Certainly. Uh, we were having this conversation. It was actually a panel conversation with Grant Sabatier, Vicki Robin, Jim Dolly, and I, and you know, we were kind of talking this philosophical, oh, it's not about money. You know, really, it's about what you do with your time. And and right. Jim was, you know, he's a, a funny guy. He kind of looked about it and he said, yeah, it's really easy to say that. But listen, you know, if you have no money and the transmission just fell out of your car or your kid is sick and you need to buy medicines, man, money is really important. It might be the only thing you can think about. On the other hand, once you get to a certain level and you have enough money, 
you don't have to really think about it anymore. So he equated it to oxygen. I think it's a great yeah. metaphor, this idea that when you don't have any oxygen, you're really craving it. On the other hand, when you have a certain amount, it stops being important whether you accumulate more or not. And I'll be the first to tell you that I came to this conversation from a place of privilege. I started thinking about these things when I had money, when I, in a sense right. I was wealthy and financially independent. But I think one of the lessons of the book is maybe we're doing it all wrong. Maybe we have to come to these conversations when we're not wealthy, when we're right at that oxygen level, like we're just getting enough to survive. Maybe then's the time we start have to have that conversation about purpose and identity. Yeah. We forget yeah. this idea, especially in financial independence. We think money is the tool. Right. Yes. And I'm here to tell you it's a tool, <laughs> not the tool. So if you think about it, there are a lot of young people right now who have very little money, right? And maybe they went to college, maybe they didn't. They get out of school and they're doing a nine to five or eight to six and they're struggling to make enough money to put food on the table. And so that person's going to say to me, look, you know, I don't have space in my life to worry about purpose and identity, but I'd push back gently on that. And I'd say, well, you know, when you're 22, you might not have a lot of tool, which is money, but you've got other tools. You've got energy, right? You've got your passions. You've got your Time. skills. <laughs> yeah. You've got your community. Mm -hmm. Like you don't probably have children. You might not have a spouse. So could you work your nine to five or eight to six and then maybe find something on the weekend you're passionate about and also turn that into a side hustle? Yeah. Maybe there's a hobby you really love. Could you start building that to a revenue stream and use one of those other tools, free time or passion, uh, to take the place of money? And and let's say that side hustle started producing a touch of money. Could you then maybe subtract out part of your eight to five or 96 you didn't like? Maybe instead of it being an eight to six, it becomes a nine to five. Maybe it comes becomes a Monday through Thursday instead of a Monday through Friday. The point is we have to look at all the tools available and we I think the best way is to start working purpose and identity into our lives as early as possible so we can be much more intentional about those decisions. That doesn't mean you might not have to grind it out at times. It doesn't mean you might not have to do a job you don't like. But right. let's start really deciding on what these trade-offs are and let's really start thinking about them. Well, and it's such an interesting topic because I think, and you've made the point very well, and I know this is something you focus on frequently with your guests on, on e &I, but I feel like irrespective of the level of privilege uh, and where one is on their journey, this concept applies, but it is just as equally ignored even by people who are already pretty far down the five path. And so, so I grabbed two quotes from your book that I think tie to this bigger question. The first is, uh, and I like this idea, we must all build our own perpetual money machine so we can use our time and energy pursuing what's more important. That makes sense. It fits very well with what you've just said. However, in contrast, maybe, you know, th this other quote, when we're unclear about our internal motivation, our end goal becomes less gratifying. And I think about this one a lot because by virtue of doing this show, we get the chance to talk with people at all different ages, many of whom, as you know, in the fire community are younger. And so they're on a path, they're, you know, they're really nose down, focused on this goal of hitting a number. But when you push a little bit and, and politely, right? You know, so what's your, you know, why? Why is this interesting to you? Where do you hope to get to? There's very little thought. Uh, and, and it's a little scarier when you find people even a few years away from their conceivable, you know, their, their number, their target, and they haven't even started this conversation. Here's the thing. When we make money a goal instead of a tool, we fall for something that in the book I call the money mind meld. It's this mirage of wealth that makes us think that wealth is the most important thing in your life and in fact blocks you from thinking yeah. about other things. Here's the problem. If you make your net worth a goal, a few things happen. One is you get to that goal eventually. Let's say you're you know, lucky or you worked hard or whatever happened, you get to that goal. Because you've never ever really thought about what that money is supposed to buy you, you've looked at it as a goal unto itself, the next best thing is to set a higher goal. Right. Yeah. Because it was so gratifying to get to, let's say, that net worth of one million dollars. You've gotten there. All of a sudden, life is empty. It's like the hedonic treadmill, except now we're talking yes. about money. I call that overdrive. It's like, OK, I need to go for the next money goal. That's one problem. The other problem is something that's called loss aversion. Mm -hmm. So there's this theory that actually we doubly fear losing what we have more than we ever fear not getting there. So you get to the million dollars net worth 
and you get petrified that you're going to lose it and you start doubling down and working harder on the side yeah. hustles and then god forbid the stock market changes <laughs> and all of a sudden your net worth is $990,000 instead of a million and it really makes us upset yeah. the point <laughs> is that money is only as good as it buys you the ability to do something else that's more meaningful. If money is your meaning and purpose, you're going to find it a very empty place to end up. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I mean, I'm so glad you brought this into the conversation. Yeah. My wife and I are heading toward a number and we've been watching the market fall and we've been watching ourselves effectively getting further and further away from this number. And I think this is one of those obsessions with people, or it can be an obsession with people who are on the path to FI and they're just so locked in and focused on that number as the goal. And, you know, as I think about my wife and I try and pull a purpose out of her and you talk about finding a purpose, you even give exercise is in this mm -hmm. book talking about how to find that. How do you recommend engaging somebody who's not ready to think about that? And I mean, it's it sounds like it's such an important part about the next step, this transition into FI. But my wife is unwilling to engage in that. How, how yeah. do I help her? So, the, you know, the silly answer is you handed my book, but no, 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 <laughs> honest, honestly, I, I think there are a few different things. Um, I think it's hard because you have to engage someone where they are. And so you might be on a different part of the path than they are. And so it's usually a series of open ended questions like dream big. What do you aspire towards? What are those kind of things that would make you most happy spending your time doing in a perfect world? And I love this exercise. Pretend you just won the lottery and you now have that, is it, what was it, a billion dollars? Yeah. You just won a billion dollars. <laughs> Let's go look at all the things you do on your schedule every day. How many of them would you still do? And so let's clear all those out. And then let's look at those empty pages and say, well, how would you fill your time? Look, it's not easy, right? Yeah. None of this is easy. We are so programmed to concentrate on money because it's manageable, right? Yeah, we right. can figure out the answers. We can side hustle. We can ask for a raise. We can work more hours. It might not be easy to get to financial independence, but the steps are knowable. Right. It's much harder to say, let's work on purpose and identity. Totally. Yeah. And to yeah. do that is to also realize life is finite and you might not get there. And that scares the heck out of everyone. So they'd much rather focus on money. Was every patient that you spent time with in the last days and weeks of their lives, were they all filled with regret and remorse? And if not, what, what, was, what were the lessons to be learned there? So certainly not. And in fact, part of the problem with this book, and I realize this at the end, is I use some of these stories because they were instructional. Sure. But also realize that laced within these stories are some very happy ones. For instance, a really happy story is this guy, Ernesto, whose dream was to climb Mount Everest. That's right. And so mm -hmm. he took time off in his 20s to go do this. And then in his 40s, he was diagnosed with leukemia. And we thought a lot about what if he had put it off? What if he said, the opportunity cost is so great. I need to make money. It needs to compound. It needs to be in the market. And I'll do this later. No, he did it now. I also have a patient who I talk at just right at the end of the book named Ronald. And in the story, he was actually that perfect version of someone who had focused on purpose and identity. And therefore, when he got to the end of his life, he didn't have a lot of regrets. The cautionary tale is to put off things that are meaningful to you because you think you don't have enough time or you think you can always manage them later. And those people who tend to think about these things earlier have an easier time when they get to end of life. Now, let me tell you, even those people who don't don't necessarily have a bad death, the problem is we end up working with them on a last minute plot change to fix things. And so my goal with this book is to keep you from that last minute plot twist. Right. What if we could start doing these things earlier so we didn't have to reconcile everything in your last six months? We could have it all, in a sense, in a nice and tidy order uh, by the time you got there, especially because, in a sense, especially the older people who die in hospice are lucky. They live a full life and then hopefully get a little bit of time to reconcile right before they die. But you might end up like my father who dies suddenly at 40. What if you could have your life somewhat in order 
way before so that if one of those tragic things happened to you, at least you kind of fulfilled your sense of purpose and did the things you thought were important for you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love this concept because, you know, it's uh, you're both very aware of this, but it's such a common idea in the fire community and, and financial advisors in particular like to preach this, um, you know, deferred gratification. Right. You know, you know, save hard now, increase that savings rate, and you can do all the things you want to do later in life. And, and that's obviously a crazy notion. And you just touched on some of that. It was one of my favorite points in the conversation we had with Fritz Gilbert from Retirement Manifesto yeah, yeah. last year. He talks about, yeah, I'm sure I could have retired probably in my early 40s instead of, you know, 55, had I been aware of certain things, had I not taken those trips and not elected to do these things with my family that were important to me. But I mean, at the end of the day, as I like saying, and you, you put it much more elegantly in your book, you know, we have an unknowable but finite number of days we are vertical on this planet. And so how do we want to spend those versus, you know, accumulating for a future state that we desire to get to so we can do all the other things? And there is a balance to be struck there. And I don't mean to say it was trivial for me to work out what worked for me and my family, nor is it for anybody else. But I like your idea of how early can we think about this and begin doing some work towards understanding it because it's only going to be beneficial. And, and one of the hardest decisions in life is to enjoy what we have now at the moment and maybe spend it's some money towards it so to YOLO versus deferred gratification. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that is a problem that we all face. And not only do we all face it, we face it on a regular basis. And so I think if you're not really thoughtful or intentional about those things, you make spur of the moment decisions. And sometimes that works out and sometimes yeah. it doesn't especially those of us in the fire world, we tend to always defer gratification or mostly defer gratification. And that can be a mistake. And yeah. Yeah. even the most successful fire practitioners, often they'll tell you, yeah, I probably could have slowed down here and there um, when they really look at their lives. Sure. Yeah. You well, know, it makes me I think, um, Jordan, I mean, like everybody, my family has been visited by terrible health situations. And I, I think back to a time in 2010, my mother was really ill and, you know, it was Christmas time and she was laying on the couch. And I remember looking at her thinking, this might be the last Christmas I ever spend with my mother. And mm -hmm. I remember how focusing that was on the present moment and how powerful that is. And I can imagine you as a hospice doctor are, are constantly called to refocus on that present moment. But here we are in 2022. My mother survived those circumstances and we continue to face new ones every day, but those lessons tend to fade with time. I mean, yeah. I now take some of that time that I have with her for granted. You know, I don't have those immediate health challenges to focus. So how do we make the lessons durable? Like the lessons in your book. Mm. So, you know, it's interesting. There are a few different ways to do this. One is this theory of memento mori, this idea to keep the idea of Beth death always constant in sure. your existence. And that's not to be morbid. It's more to realize this fact that we don't know when death comes. It could be around the corner. So let's enjoy today. I say it often in the book, we're dying from the day we are born. Yep. But it's true. Like at some point, we are human beings of habit. And when the bad thing doesn't happen, we forget. And that's why I think it's really reasonable to do your own sense of life review on a regular basis. For some people, that'll be every six months or every year. I'm not talking about something that takes hours and hours and hours, but sitting down and goal setting once a year, once every six months, and really trying to think about what are my true goals? What has purpose and meaning for me? Am I pursuing those things? How does my current schedule align up with what's important to me? Right. It's not a bad time to also look at your finances. Am I using my finances right. as a tool to meet my goals? <laughs> um, I don't think we can ever ask that enough. Um, and so I think that's a good way to start. And, and you also have to let yourself off the hook. Again, we are human by nature. <laughs> You don't have to be with your loved one every moment and sit there and think, oh, my God, I might not get another moment with you. <laughs> right. But we certainly also don't want to never have that thought. Yeah, so that's helpful. the question is, what's the in between? Like, yeah. let's make sure that we at least cherish some of those moments that were intentional and thoughtful. But that doesn't mean every time you stop by to drop off a gallon of milk because they couldn't make it to the store that you sit there, hold their hands, <laughs> look deeply into their eyes and, and tell them how much you love them. I mean, that's just not durable. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. That's great advice. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. 
So if, if I can, I, I want to maybe take a, just a, another step back to the idea of the lessons we can learn from those under hospice care. And and this is, I'm going to talk about one of the, what I thought for me personally, make this a very personal anecdote, was one of the most profound and impactful phrases that I caught. And it, it has to do with this concept that the issues of the newly fi financially independent are similar to those of, of, of those who are dying. And the quote is, when financial concerns are removed, the mirror of financial independence not only reflects, but also magnifies all the inadequacies and fears left over, fears about purpose, identity, and connection. And that just resonated with me and just took me back to those first mm -hmm. months after I mm -hmm. you know, left my career behind. Can you talk a little about that lesson and, and how it applies? Because you are someone post-fi and you do deal with people who have experienced this from a, a death and dying perspective. So listen, none of us want to be in that room when a doctor like me comes in and says, I'm sorry, you're dying, right? There's yeah. nothing good about that. But the one piece that I always tell people to think about is when all of a sudden you're told you're dying, it gives you the excuse to let go of all of societal expectations, all those things people told you you should be, everything that has no value, and yeah. you get to baldly look at life and what's important to you, right? Not very many times in life do you get that ability. I would suggest that for people who concentrate on money as the goal, and all of a sudden realize they're financially independent, the same exact thing happens. You're like, oh, I no longer have to do things to make money. And again, that gives you that plain look at life, not as you think it's supposed to be, but as it truly is. And that can be very disconcerting. Yeah. When you look in that mirror and realize I'm dropping all of this narrative I had about money going through my head for the last 20 years, and I'm just going to look at myself outside of money as an accomplishment, an achievement, or an identity, what reflects back at you might be scary. Yeah. You might see that you haven't developed yourself, that you don't know what's purposeful to you, that you don't know who you are as a person. That's uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> That's no fun. As I look at your, the titles that you can now put behind your name, you can, you've just added author to it. You're a podcaster. You're a doctor. You're a, all of these things, right? How do you think you came to be this hyphenated version of yourself? Because I understand not only from listening to you on your podcast, but and other interviews, but also from reading your book that you, there was a strong sense of identity tied up in being a doctor. Right. And there's a great process that happened for me personally when I started my business. I started this business as an architect, but I don't consider myself just an architect anymore. I'm many more things. And I'm curious to know if these lessons, you think these lessons came from your experience learning from people in hospice, or if they're drawn more from the fact that you stepped away from your sole sort of sense of identity as a medical doctor into this sort of unknown journey as a financial educator, as a podcaster, as a blogger, a writer, an author. Um, can you speak about that a little bit? Certainly. So I wore this identity of being a physician around my outsides like a cloak. The problem was that didn't match the identity I had on the inside. It yeah. never fit comfortably. And that's why I never made lots of doctor friends. I hated telling people I was a doctor. I'd go to parties and I'd be ashamed. And it's like the craziest thing because in my mind, I logically know that being a doctor is a very, very proud profession. I mean, we do right. important things, but it didn't fit right. So I knew that discomfort. I also knew there were parts of me that I found real joy in. So I had been writing about medicine since 2005, fitting my writing time into these little bits of space whenever I could do it, then I wasn't busy and I wasn't on call and I wasn't otherwise distracted. And I almost felt guilty for spending time doing the stuff that I loved. But I also realized that it fit me more. So how did I come to this conclusion? I had to try on a lot of identities. Yeah. I had to feel the disconnect of them not fitting me. For me, the path actually first led to realizing I had enough money to not have to do things for a living like being a doctor. Yeah. And then I had to do a deep dive into what is purposeful for me, what has meaning. 
I was lucky enough at the time to also realize the one part of being a doctor that still fit was doing the hospice work. Right. And by interacting with hospice patients, I started seeing answers to all the questions I was gleaning from my financial conversations. Hmm. Like I was writing a financial blog, I was doing a financial podcast. We had far past this idea of what do we do to get to financial independence? Right. But the bigger question was what now? What does it mean? What does meaning look like in a post-financial independence world? And that's kind of where I started gleaning these other messages from my hospice patients. So I think it was a mix of all of it. It was the discontent sure. of trying to be someone that I wasn't. And then it was all the tools and resources, information that was out there in front of me. And I guess, like, don't they say something like, when you're ready to ask the question, the answers will become apparent. Yes. And yes. I, think sure that's, yes. <laughs> I think that's exactly where I was. Is I, it took me that long to shed the cloak of being a physician, to shed the cloak of wealth and money to realize that that was only a tool and not the end all be all. And then the questions came running out of me like a fountain and there was hospice medicine and these dying patients who had a wealth of experience and were forced, and I really mean forced, to come to terms with their own lives. And, you know, I just learned from that. I soaked it in and it, it, it became part of how I understood the rest of my life. Yeah, I, I think it's a really helpful and it's a very instructive uh, tale, Jordan, because, you know, a lot of people uh, talk about this concept of, you know, phi without the RE and they talk about, well, you know, I, there are things I can do when I achieve financial independence. Maybe I'll cut my hours. Maybe I'll, you know, do something different or what have you. And I, I think it's interesting to hear sort of your experience, your internal dialogue about how did you start to discover these things that added the most value to you? They were very, you know, central to your training and your life, but you talk about this reducing 90%, subtracting 90% away, going into the 10%. And I don't think you hear as many tales in our community, at least, about how do you get to that next thing that you find value in? Um, and so that RE isn't the only option. Yeah. And I think that's just great. And I will tell you, like, now, knowing what I know now, if I had been more in touch with my sense of purpose and identity, when I graduated medical school, went to residency, I probably would have studied to be a hospice doctor. Yeah. Yeah. I would have made a lot less money. I would have been nowhere near financial independence, but I probably would have found a greater sense of meaning in my work. I probably would have never burned out in medicine. And I would probably still be working at 60, 65, maybe finally reaching financial independence at that older age. Right. But I might have enjoyed my career and life much more, too. Yeah. So I think we need to we need to step away from this idea that there's a specific timeline to mm. get to financial independence and that if you don't get there in that specific time, you're doing it wrong. I think you're doing it wrong if you don't consider financial independence because yeah. financial independence is a really important tool in our toolkit, but it's one of many. I think we need to consider it, but we've got to start with purpose, identity, and connections, then build in our financial timeline. Ultimately, the goal of financial independence is to live a more meaningful life but you don't have to wait to get there to start yeah. doing that now. Yeah. And that's, I, I, that's yeah. the message. That I think that's such an important message. And, and I need to borrow some phrasing from you that I'm going <laughs> to take from this call, because I'll tell you, I, I spend time, as I've mentioned, in some other uh, fire communities. And one of the areas where I find I get frustrated and I have to check myself because I'm trying to be constructive and, and be supportive, but I get frustrated when I hear young people talk about, well, everything's kind of on autopilot now. I'm in the messy middle. I just got to grind it out. And I learned that they're grinding it out is like 10 or 15 years. And that that's not living if you're not, you know, getting, you know, fulfillment, enjoyment. If it's just literally money and the pursuit of it to a number, it's kind of a scary thing. Um, and, and I haven't exactly figured out how to address that, you know, in, in the sort of best language. But I think there's some good there's some good thoughts in there. I think the key to that is you will find yourself amazingly unhappy as you get closer and closer to financial independence because money solves money problems. Yes. And money problems are one of many human problems. And if you don't put any of your energy to start looking at those other problems, what is purposeful? What are those important connections I have? What relationships are important to me? What do I want to accomplish in my lifetime. If you don't think about that stuff at all, 
you will find financial independence very hollow and depressing. And then you're going to be stuck doing all that hard work. So as opposed to putting yourself through that, I really encourage people to start doing some of the hard work now. You might find that you don't actually have to ground, grind it out for the next 10 or 15 years. But even if you do, being intentional about the trade-offs will feel much better. The perfect example, there's this guy who used to go by the the name The Happy Philosopher, um, who was in the financial independence movement a while back. He's a radiologist. His name was Jeff. Jeff got burned out in medicine much like I did, and he started on this crazy path to financial independence. Somewhere in the middle, he realized that he could go part-time, work an extra five or 10 years. It would delay his path to financial independence, but he would live a much better life where he had more time to do the things that were important to him. Here's the funny thing. He never went part-time. Just knowing that that was a possibility <laughs> oh, wow. relieved him to such an extent that he didn't find being a radiologist is laborsome anymore. In fact, he started remembering why he went into it in the first place. What he was fighting against was a sense of control. And once he allowed himself these different possibilities, he was able to control the outcome. In this case, he eventually decided to grind it out a little. He said, you know what? Knowing I have this control, it isn't so bad. I think I would rather get to financial independence sooner. I'm not going part time. He could have done the exact opposite. He could have said, you know what? This is unbearable. I'm going to go part time and yeah. I can reach financial independence in 20 years. And that's great. Or he could have gone part time, found a side hustle or side gig to fill up that other space, something he was passionate about. And maybe right. if it started generating revenue, he could have left being a physician much earlier. The point is there are opportunities there. We think we only have one path, and when we only think we only have one path, we get blinders and we forget to see that there are other ways around these problems. And I would just hate to see someone do this where they exhibit this complete lack of control over their lives because that's what really makes us feel bad. Yeah. You know, I think in the FIRE community, um, especially for those of us pre-FI, there's a huge focus on the mathemat solving the mathematical problem. Mm -hmm. You know, totally. what is it going to be enough for me to live? And we can solve it from an expense standpoint. We can, we can solve it from, you know, what, do, what do I want to live on per year? What do I want to do? What's my life look like? But you talk about enough, this concept of enough in the book, yeah. what is enough for you? How did you decide what is enough? Because I think right, your, so your mother talked about, Hey, $10 million, right? Didn't she throw that out as a number? So, I actually have a very clear definition now in my mind is of what is enough and it has nothing to do with money. Oh, okay. But I wanted to give you one caveat there. People are afraid they're going to run out of money. They're afraid they won't have enough. How come no one's worried that they're going to run out of life or that they're not going to have enough life? I always wonder that. Like, <laughs> yeah. how come we think it's money is like the most important thing and no one questions, what if I run out of experiences and don't have enough experiences? What if I don't have enough love? What if I don't have enough hobbies? Like, we focus on money as if it's the end all be all. And there are a lot of other things. I think it's fine to use mathematical equations to calculate enough money or at least to give you a roundabout idea of what enough really looks like. But the truth of the matter is, for me, enough looks like a completely different thing. In the book, I call it the climb. What happiness is for me, and this is definitely how I would think of enough, is happiness is finding these climbs, these things that give us a sense of meaning and purpose, that we enjoy the process regardless of the goal or the end point, but that we also feel like we're making incremental gains. So a perfect example that I bring up all the time with people is podcasting. I love podcasting. That is part of my meaning and purpose in life. <laughs> it's one of the things I love doing most. I could have a goal of getting a million downloads a month. We all know how difficult that would be, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. I may or may not reach that goal. And if I focus on that goal, I'm probably going to be miserable because it's a really hard goal to attain. On the other hand, I could turn that around and say, I want to do this thing because it gives me a sense of meaning and purpose. And I love having those conversations. There's no place I'm happier than behind the mic. So my climb is doing a podcast. I love the process. Regardless of if anyone listens, I still love doing it every day. 
And maybe I get a thousand downloads a month and I go for a thousand one hundred. And so if I feel like I can make a better show and I can move up a little bit, that's happiness. And if you can build enough of those climbs in your life, that's that big thing we're looking for. You know, Maslow's hierarchy talks yeah. about self-actualization. If you yeah. talk about happiness researchers, when they look at happiness and money, they look at life satisfaction and emotional well-being. I use the terms purpose, identity, and connections, but what we're really looking for is to fill our lives with these series of climbs that fulfill us. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Yeah. And that's enough for me. Like enough is doing a podcast, feeling like I'm making a little headway and having these amazing conversations. It is, that's it's, enough. It's great to define it like that. I wonder how I have this conversation with my 18 year old son. I mean, we all are naturally inclined to think about money as being a driving force. I look at all the concerns of my 18 year old and they're all focused around money. So how do I, how do we teach our kids about this? I mean, how do we change the mindset here as they're moving into adulthood? I don't know how to advise them. Kids don't concentrate on money per se. They concentrate on all those things money can do for them. Yeah. So it's a great time to start saying, sure. well, let's talk about the stuff that you want to do and why that stuff is important, whether it's buying something, whether it's experiences, whatever it is. And if we can identify what they feel is purposeful at this age, what they identify as, even if it's going to change over the long term, then again, we can start moving that back to the lifestyle questions as well as the financial situation. So the, here are our goals. How do we get there? I think the problem with us as adults is we forget to care about the goals. <laughs> Kids are a little more self-absorbed, though. They're, yeah. they, they know what they want, whether it's that nice it's car, it's whether true. it's that trip, whether it's that experience. So we can focus on those goals and then turn it back and start at the beginning. Yeah, that's awesome advice. Thank you. I'd like to focus the conversation a little bit about how you use your time now. How is it, how is it different than when you were a physician? So I love to think about this idea that we have a certain number of time slots. You can think about them however you want to, whether that's days or months or years, et cetera. But we have these time slots we can fill with activities. So the difference is when I was a physician, more of those time slots were filled with activities that were burdensome, uh -huh. that caused me pain or headaches or I didn't enjoy as much. When I got a better hold of my finances and started looking at better ways to live my life, I started subtracting out all those things that were filling my time slots with things I didn't like to do. And I started filling those time slots with things I did like to do. And so that's like the power, right? Whether you're financially independent, which gives you this big tool of money, which lets you do some of this immediately, or whether you're at the beginning of your career and you have to look at some of those other tools and start making decisions of how do we start subtracting out those things that fill those time slots we don't like mm -hmm. and adding in things we do like. That's the process. And so now my life looks a lot more purposeful because I've been able to get rid of a lot of those things I don't like doing. Yeah. What, can, can you paint some details here? Paint the picture of what, what a typical day is, maybe what, uh, do you take vacations anymore? Are you allowed to take vacations <laughs> as a hospice doctor? I don't think you can. So first and foremost, um, I feel like I have more hours in the day than I know what to do with, which for most people awesome. is really surprising. Yeah. Like I feel like the world is vast and every day has plenty of time. So that's first and foremost, because I'm just not rushing to do things. So I typically get up in the morning and I don't sleep real well. So I get up about four, 445. I usually work out for a good 30, 45 minutes. I stretch for 30, 45 minutes because my body's old and I have to do physical therapy exercise. My back hurts, that kind of stuff. I'll make a cup of coffee and read. I usually read at least two hours a day, but usually I'll do 30, 45 minutes in the morning. After that, it's, you know, wake up with the kids, shower, spend time with them. If they need to be driven to school or whatever, I can do all that stuff. The rest of my day is spent doing things I like. I generally try to spend a lot of time exercising, not heavy exercise. I just like walking and things that keep my body moving. Right. I spend a lot of time reading every day. And then as much time as possible podcasting, whether that's doing interviews or editing or doing those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And then I can throw in all sorts of stuff there. Maybe I'm working on a book. Maybe I'm going to a conference. Maybe I'm helping around the house and cleaning the house. Whatever really needs doing, I feel like I have that space and abundance to do it. One of the things that surprises people is I don't really differentiate between weekdays and weekends yes. very much because – the weird thing about this is people like the weekends for rest. I work all the time and I don't work all the time. So I'm just as likely to be working on my podcast on Saturday night as I am on Monday morning. Yeah. Um, 
because I choose activities now that some people would call work, but to me, it's just what I happen to want to do at that given time. So the only thing that really marks the days and the weeks is more my kid's schedule or my wife's schedule because I can kind of do it whenever I want to. It's a very free way to live. And I have to tell you, I don't ever want to go back to the other way. Like this is really joyful to have some of this control I guess the only sadness is I didn't figure out how to do this a lot earlier. I was going right? to say, yeah, that doesn't I, sound like a life that has a lot of high costs involved in it. Not for me. I mean, granted, I live in a very high cost of living area. Okay. I mean, like yeah. property tax. I mean, Chicago, sure. I live outside of Chicago and Evans. So we, we are one of those people who you look at our budget and you're like, wow, like <laughs> okay. that's a lot of money for someone who's interested in financial independence. <laughs> but that was part of that lifestyle I kind of built by making money and saving and investing and doing all those things. But none of that costs money. Most, most, most of the joy I personally find is really in the ability to control yeah. what I do during those time slots. I mean, that yeah. to me is like, that's wealth. That's yeah. like, that's feeling rich. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I, I agree. And that's very relatable for me. Um, I, I can completely identify with everything you've just said there. The, the only counter I would add, or maybe it's a difference, maybe it's not because you've got a longer runway at this than I do. I'm just now two years after leaving my primary career. Um, I found that in the first six months, I had this very strong inclination to just jam stuff into all those time slots. And maybe that's just a manifestation of the type of kind of pace of work I had in biotech and the schedule I kept. I, I don't think it was I didn't know what to do. I had things I was doing that I really enjoyed. And, and we, Eric and I started working on this show within the first six, seven months after I stopped working. Um, but I just I realized and Eric honestly helped me realize it, that I felt the need to like schedule myself to death and and feel like I had I had to do things um, and, and realizing that I did not, you know, and maybe if I had done that subtraction exercise <laughs> earlier on, that never would have happened. But uh, so maybe it's a cautionary tale, but that was a very real thing for me. Now I don't feel that anymore. You know, it's interesting. I, for better or for worse, sidestep that because it took me years to get to this point. Mm. So I slowly got rid of things because I wasn't I ready see. to walk away from that physician identity because yeah. it was very uncomfortable. So the first thing I did is I got rid of my practice, but I kept on doing nursing homework and hospice work and a few other things. So I was still pretty busy. Then I got rid of nursing homework and was doing full-time hospice work. Then I was like, you know, forget this. I'm not doing nights and weekends anymore. <laughs> I'm not having like a pager, like waking me up in the middle of the night to do things. But the nice thing about this slow process is it really eased me into it. Yeah. There's an adjustment period, especially if you go from everything to nothing. Right. Oh, yes, there is. Your brain and body are not prepared for that. Um, and that's OK. Like, it's just one way of doing with it. It's like um, coming off of caffeine all at once versus slowly coming off it. If you are a four coffee cup drinker a day and you go from four cups to zero, you're going to have a bad headache for a while. Yeah. Fair. But eventually you'll get over it and you'll be just fine. On the other hand, if you go from four cups to three cups a day to two cups a day and over a few months, you get down to a half a cup a day and then at some point you just stop, you might have a mild headache, but it'll be pretty quick and you'll be over and moving on before you know it. And I think you 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 went from four cups to zero and I tended to go from four cups to <laughs> to a half cup really yeah. slowly. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's a fair point. I also went from like four cups to zero into lockdown and moving to a new area. Yeah. So really, yeah. I, I think on the benefit side, and I am a glass half full kind of person, I freely admit, uh, it did force me to confront a lot of things very, you know, m more in a more concentrated fashion. So maybe, maybe that was beneficial if while also being very disruptive uh definitely had a lot of contemplation and i also found walking and hiking to be very very effective uh ways for me to have pr pr uh to create time to think through all these things on my own and then be more equipped to talk about them with my wife or anybody else or on this show uh afterwards but yeah it, it was definitely going to zero well, yeah i would tell you that um Exercise, classical music, and meditation <laughs> yeah. are really good tools at dealing with some of that post-work anxiety. We are go, go, go people, especially if you got to financial independence early. We are used to living with a certain amount of anxiety, and when all of that disappears, the anxiety doesn't. <laughs> yes. That's right. God. That's accurate. <laughs> Thank you for acknowledging uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> totally accurate. You know, I've summed up my book and my message in a few sentences, and it's Purpose and identity and connections come first. 
then the path to financial independence. And last but not least, then we have to figure how to work in YOLO versus deferred gratification in everyday life. I think those are three doable steps. You just got to know to work on them. And if you do that, I think you'll be able to fill those time slots with things that gratify you. And it'll be very meaningful. And when you do meet a doctor like me, instead of having regrets, you will feel at peace with the life you lived. Amazing. It's, a, it's an amazing book. I recommend people go out and buy it. It's available on Amazon um, and wherever you buy books. It is a book that is full of emotion where most financial independence retirement planning books lack. It's <laughs> yeah. not about numbers. And, and that's why I think it resonated with both Jason and I. And we really appreciate your time coming on the show to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This conversation was a blast. Mm -hmm.